Il primo outlook di quest'anno è dedicato a uno dei temi fondamentali per la nostra economia ma per tutti ed è il tema dei prezzi del cibo e della sicurezza alimentare. Il 2022 come l'anno precedente sono stati anni di fortissima volatilità nei prezzi del cibo ma non solo, dalle grandi siccità agli eventi estremi meteorologici fino alla guerra in Ucraina c'è stata una successione di shock che hanno colpito i mercati agricoli e il commercio internazionale del cibo. Soltanto nel mese di dicembre il livello dei prezzi misurato della FAO è tornato ai livelli di fine 2021. Ma quale sarà la realtà di domanda e offerta sul mercato? Quali saranno le iniziative da mettere in campo per combattere la malnutrizione e la fame a livello internazionale? E dopo l'accordo per il grano, l'accordo del Mar Nero tra Russia e Ucraina mediato dalla Turchia, quali saranno le altre possibili aree di tensione nel mercato del cibo? Ne parliamo insieme a Massimo Torero che è il Chief Economist della FAO a Roma. Grazie di essere con noi, benvenuto Torero. Welcome and thanks for your time. No, thank you so much for, for the kind invitation. So, yes, as you said, we just issued on Friday the full price index and this for the ninth consecutive month has declined and right now is 132.4 points in December, which is 1% below the value a year early. But that does not mean that the problem is resolved. Uh, on the contrary, We have to be very careful because for cereals, uh, prices are still very high relative to the previous years. And also there are commodities like rice where the food price is increasing. So we need to keep being vigilant and trying to, to, to monitor the evolution of prices so that we are able to help to reduce the problem of food access that we have today. È sicuramente comunque una buona notizia il fatto che ci sia una maggiore stabilità nei prezzi dell'alimentare. Guardiamo rapidamente alle diverse componenti che fanno l'indice dei prezzi misurato mese per mese dalla FAO, perché l'abbassamento è dovuto fondamentalmente a un calo nei prezzi degli oli di natura vegetale, significa la soia ma significa anche l'olio di girasole che sono scesi del 6,7%, anche l'indice che misura il prezzo dei cereali è sceso dell'1,9%, nel mondo della carne ci sono da una parte i bovini e il pollame che scendono di prezzo mentre il maiale e anche gli ovini salgono. Ci sono poi due segni più che sono quelli dei prodotti lattiero caseari e quelli del prezzo dello zucchero. Quali sono le aree dove pensate ci sia ancora nel mercato maggiore tensione? Guardando al 2023 lei stava citando ad esempio il riso perché ci sono anche altre aree di attenzione? So, Torero, what are the main areas of attention for you? Because we mentioned the different uh, components of the six uh, baskets that, contained in, that are contained in the price index. You mentioned rice, but how about all the rest of, you know, uh, yeah. so, the food? So, let me elaborate a little bit on this and why I said that we need to keep vigilant. What is the major concern right now? Food availability in terms of cereals uh, was able to be accomplished in 2022 meaning that despite the war in Ukraine and despite other issues that happen in the agri-food system, uh, food was available and the Black Sea Initiative helped enormously to have cereals available. There was a significant amount of cereals that were able to move out of Ukraine, which released storage, which allowed Ukrainians to save and to store the new harvest, and which also helped to stabilize the prices, and that's why we have been observing since March, which was the highest historically decline in prices. But we are facing other challenges, which is specifically linked to the cost of food. And the cost of food was very high during the last year, and it was higher than 2021. Uh, and therefore, as a consequence of that, many countries are facing a challenge of food access. And that's where the food import bill has increased uh, substantially. Uh, and the food import bill for the most vulnerable countries, the 62 most vulnerable countries, for example, has increased in $25 billion. So the problem we face is of food access right now. Now, in addition, the situation that we faced last year created a problem of the linkage between natural gas and the production of nitrogen fertilizer, which resulted in an increase in the cost of fertilizers. And the import bill of inputs increased in, in more than 50%, and in terms of fertilizers, even went up to three times more the original cost of fertilizers. Now we are in around 1.5. That has affected the producers because the increase in the price of inputs is higher than the increase in the price of their own output, especially rice producers. So rice area planted has reduced, and that has increased the price of rice in all the different varieties. Also, we are observing still an increase in the power price of dairy, of milk, and also, of course, in sugar. 
But for us, the major concern is on rice uh, because that is the commodity which is the highest imported commodity in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa especially. So it's a, it's a very important staple for the most poorest countries, and we need to find a way in which th this can be resolved. Mm -hmm. So to, in 2023, our concern is more on food access, of course, but also on food availability if we are not able to increase the supplies, especially in the case of rice. Lei ha citato il tema dei fertilizzanti, la carenza di fertilizzanti ha fatto eh, decollare i prezzi di tanti generi alimentari e poi c'è l'inflazione contro cui le banche centrali stanno cercando di combattere. Poi ci sono degli elementi più difficili da combattere che sono gli eventi meteorologici estremi che hanno pesato molto sul mercato anche nel 2022. Pensate che la combinazione di questi effetti sia pronta a far ripartire i prezzi nel 2023? Do you think that the combination of the shortage in fertilizer that you were mentioning together with inflation that central banks are trying to, to fight and, you know, weather, extreme weather events that were more frequent in 2022 might, you know, push price higher in 2023 again? No, you raise a very important issue. The way in which the import bill of countries which are net food imported countries work is the price of the commodity, but also the exchange rate, because they have to buy dollars to buy the commodity. Now, still the U.S., although there has been some improvement, they are facing a significant problem of inflation. The same in the case of Europe, although Europe is doing better in terms of inflation now in the latest estimates. But what this means, that the policies being put by the central bank to increase interest rates, especially in the U.S., will devaluate more the exchange rate of the poor countries. And therefore, as a consequence, the import bill is not only increasing because of prices, but it's also increasing because of exchange rate devaluation. So the inflation in the world, especially in developed countries, especially in the U.S., is affecting the exchange rate because of the policies being put in place by central banks, and that is affecting also the import bill of countries. So let's hope that now we can have a reduction of inflation in, in the U.S., and that will help to stop this increase in interest rate because it's really affecting the import bill uh, of these countries. And that's something to look at uh, very, very carefully. Now, the other point that you raised, which is more a medium and long-term issue, is the climate change. And climate change affects the agricultural sector in four dimensions. First, in terms of extreme temperatures. Second, in terms of flooding, like what happened in Pakistan. Third, in terms of uh, variability, because the producer doesn't know, because if the climate varies a lot, that has a consequence in their decisions. And fourth, on how pests and diseases will evolve because of the change in temperatures. That can affect any of the big exporting countries of cereals. So the way we work in the agri-food system in terms of the exports in the world, there are five countries that are the key exporters of cereals in the world. So if something happens to any of these countries, for example, right now Argentina, which is a key exporter of wheat and soybeans, is facing significant problem of drought. And that could affect their yields and could affect the next planting season, and that automatically will be reflected in terms of prices. And then, of course, countries will react and put export restrictions, which also will exacerbate the situation. But the agri-food system, especially the cereal world, is very concentrated in few exporters, five countries export most of the cereals. Anything that happens to any of them because of weather will affect the world prices, similar to what we have observed in terms of the war affecting one key exporting country, Ukraine, and also Russian Federation. Torero, quando è esplosa la guerra in Ucraina esattamente un anno fa, nel primo trimestre del 2022, si temeva davvero anche una catastrofe alimentare perché i granai d'Europa, la Russia e l'Ucraina erano sostanzialmente fermi e non partivano le navi, che poi si sono rimesse in moto grazie a quell'accordo che abbiamo citato. Il tema è che c'era grande preoccupazione naturalmente per le popolazioni direttamente coinvolte, quelle che consumano di più il grano di importazione, lei ha citato i paesi del sub -Sahara ma anche per l'impatto sociale che questo avrà. Da questo punto di vista in Italia, ovviamente in Europa c'era preoccupazione di una crisi sociale in quei paesi che potrebbe innescare nuovi flussi migratori. Vede concretamente questo come un rischio che anche nel 2023 eh, abbiamo di fronte e come affrontarlo? So in 2022, Torero, you know, when the, the crisis of the war broke, there was a lot of concern for uh, hunger shock and, uh, in the sub-Saharan sub countries and also for a social crisis that could trigger more migration towards Europe and, and so on. Do you feel like that 2023 we are running the same kind of risk or the situation is different? First, we need to understand that even before the war in Ukraine, prices were already going up because of the recovery plans the developed countries implemented, which increased the demand. 
This was exacerbated with the war in Ukraine, which created a huge supply shock because there were less exports coming out from Ukraine and Russian Federation, which exported 30% of the cereals. And it also affected the cost of fertilizers, specifically of nitrogen, because it depends on natural gas production. And that created an exacerbation of the situation. And sure, it increased the number of chronically undernourished people. And that put pressure on food crisis countries, especially. And yes, that could have a consequence in terms of migration. Now, what is important also to understand is that the, the bigger importers of, of, of wheat and, 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 and corn from, from Ukraine and Russian Federation were Northern Africa and some South Asia countries. But South Saharan Africa doesn't import a lot of wheat. Although on the little they import, they have a big share on these countries, their level of imports is small. For them, rice is more relevant, the imports of rice in the world, and cassava, of course, which they produce. So, so we need to put in, in context on, on what commodity is the most vulnerable for them. Now, for 2023, we still, as I said, have not resolved the problem of food access. FAO pushed an initiative called the Food Import Financing Facility, which the IMF took, and they are implementing it, calling it the Food Crisis Window. And the idea was exactly to provide balance of payment support to the most vulnerable countries, the 62 more vulnerable countries, so that they can cope with their food access problem. Because as I said before, their food access was affected by prices and also by exchange rate devaluation. So this is partially helped by the IMF window, but still we need to expand it more. So yes, right now, if we don't support the countries in improving their food access, they will have less access to food, they will have less quality food, and that could create a problem at the country level, could create social unrest, and could create more migration. So we need to be very worried. But also what we are arguing is that the food access problem that we have in 2022, and not a food availability problem, could also become a food availability problem because of the issue of inputs and fertilizers, especially in the case of rice. So we need to find a solution so that we don't convert also this into a food access plus a food availability problem, because then we are really in a big problem, mm -hmm. and that's something that we need to avoid. Uh, Torero, lei ha citato la disponibilità di cibo anche come uno degli elementi che compongono questa crisi. Da grande tempo tutti si chiedono come i governi, in particolare i governi dei paesi e delle economie più sviluppate, possano aiutare a combattere la malnutrizione, la fame e gli squilibri che creano poi delle tensioni a livello sociale così grandi e grande sofferenza. Ma in concreto serve più cibo, serve aumentare i livelli di produzione o serve riguardare anche il sistema di distribuzione del cibo e il mercato del cibo a livello internazionale. In concreto cosa possono fare i paesi per affrontare questa sfida? So you, you mentioned, you, you know, the, the, the crisis has, you, you, we need to find a solution. What kind of could be the solution to fight hunger and malnutrition uh, given all the uh, current situation that you all already mentioned? Yeah, so the, the core element that we need to improve is on resilience. And resilience has three components. The first one is we need to improve our tools that we provide to countries so that they have better early warning systems so that they can avoid these type of shocks. For example, if we knew that a shock is happening in one key exporting country, we need to find ways in which they have more diversity of from where to import so that they can access to the food no matter their key importing partner is closed, like what happened with, with the war. So one way to increase resilience for countries is to diversify from where they import but also, of course, is to improve productivity and local production. But this is different from being self-sufficient. It means that you increase and produce as much as you can within your comparative advantages. So those two elements will help to increase resilience and also the early warning tools so that they are prepared. The second element is, okay, how we can resolve this global problem? Because the problem that we are facing in the world is that we are running an agri-food system that is facing shocks and risk, risk and uncertainties. And given the high concentration of the countries that export, very few countries export these commodities, anything that happens in any five countries will affect my local price. And for that, we need to increase the way we produce. We need to have more producers, more bigger producers and exporters of these commodities so that the world diversifies more their supply of cereal commodities. And we also need to find ways in which we can gain efficiencies. So FAO has been very active in promoting efficiencies in the way we use inputs, for example. Today, around 50% of the fertilizers we use are wasted. If we use proper soil maps and we develop proper soil maps and we are doing an effort today for that, that will help to increase not only the use of fertilizers, but also the impact on productivity because you will use the proper blending, how much N, how much P, and how much K your soil needs 
for the commodity that you're growing, given the current conditions. The other efficiency gain where we think we can really make a lot of progress is on food loss and food waste reduction. I think we have a huge window. 30% of the food in the world is, is lost or wasted. 14% is lost, 17% is wasted. We have to change regulation for waste. We have to find ways to improve storage capacity, to improve productivity in the field, to reduce losses and waste. That will enormously contribute to food availability and especially will contribute to affordability of healthy diets, which is what we need today. 3.1 billion people today don't have access to healthy diets. And that's what we need to change. And for that, we need to have more supplies in the world, but also change behavior so that we don't overconsume and create uh, overweight and obesity. And we also access so that they cannot underconsume, which is then the nutrition problem. So efficiency gains will be central. And in the long term, of course, we need to reduce inequalities. That's essential. If we don't reduce inequalities in the world, we won't be able to make these countries resilient. And that means infrastructure. That means building not only roads and railroads and more connectivity so that trade can flow better, but also we have to build a value chain infrastructure so that countries can store their commodities, have more capacity of cooling facilities, and of course, policies that will encourage that so that we can increase uh, inter-regional trade, global trade, but also local production and productivity. Ancora due flash prima di chiudere, Massimo Torero. Il primo riguarda i sussidi all'agricoltura che le grandi economie hanno messo in campo in tutti questi anni, anche la politica agricola europea che ha fatto tanto discutere gli agricoltori italiani. Come dovrebbero cambiare il disegno, l'architettura di questi sussidi per non buttare via soldi, per fare in modo che siano davvero efficienti? Che ruolo potranno avere in futuro? Uh, just a couple of flash because before we wrap it up, uh, Massimo Torero. The first one is about subsidies, agriculture subsidies. And what's your take on the new architecture they should have, the design of these subsidies to be really efficient and to address the challenge of, of food security in the way that you were mentioning? No, exactly. Today, the agricultural sector uses $630 billion per year on average in support to agriculture. And most of this is going to input subsidies, is going to subsidies based on, on factors of production, and it's going to other mechanisms that create distortions. So I think it's a time to carefully assess, and the European Union has done a lot on this, but we need to assess carefully how we can repurpose all these subsidies. Given that we don't have more money, using the money that we have, how we can allocate that money in a, in a best way, which is not, for example, to support commodities like cereals, which are not necessarily part of these healthy diets that we need to consume, or to other activities that are creating more greenhouse gas emissions and are depleting the natural resources. So I think we need to work enormously to try to find ways in which we can repurpose uh, these subsidies in a better way uh, so that we can obtain better returns and align the incentives so that we can respond to this need of improvement on access to, to healthy diet. So there is a window of opportunity. We have done simulations on the supply side And there are options of repurposing that will bring better solutions in terms of access to healthy diets and less environmental damage. And there are also ways in which we can allocate subsidies to consumers, especially targeting them to the most vulnerable that will also bring benefits, especially in poor countries. E l'ultimo spunto riguarda anche la tecnologia perché anche l'agricoltura, l'allevamento stanno vivendo una profonda rivoluzione tecnologica che aiuta sicuramente a ridurre gli sprechi, a usare meglio le risorse, automatizza però l'agricoltura e il lavoro dei campi anche in tanti paesi in via di sviluppo dove crea disoccupazione. Come vede l'impatto dell'agritech da questo punto di vista e sarà la tecnologia a aiutarci a risolvere alcuni di questi problemi? So how, what's your vision of the future of agri-tech and the impact that it will have on the positive, but also the, how to be cautious on, you know, also the social impact of agri-tech? No, we have, we have just published a report uh, on automation in agriculture. And agri-tech, including digital automation technology, is already playing a significant role in reshaping food production, although currently their use is more concentrated in high-income countries. So the inequalities are coming up. Why? because poorer countries don't necessarily have access to the digital part, which is essential and is the baseline on most of the automation today. But there are examples of how we can use automation to perform tasks that are possible to be done in a smallholder production. There are ways in which we can increase efficiency. For example, the soil maps I was talking, I can provide soil data information through apps 
to small holders so that they can make better decisions on what type of fertilizer they need to use. I can use digital technologies to trace commodity to improve access to food safety indicators so that we can trade more. But if we don't do a reform in which we are careful in reducing those inequalities, we won't be able to use those technologies and that automation to improve the most vulnerable people. On the contrary, what we will do is we will increase inequalities. So I think the trend that we are observing is pretty good and it's going to continue, but we need to make a significant investments, and that's where public sector has to play a role and also international cooperation, so that we can also improve the efficiency of most vulnerable countries so that they can also benefit from this technology. What we are observing today through e-commerce and through the use of robots, through soil sampling and so on, is that there is a huge potential. There is even a potential to bring precision farming to smallholders by creating public goods. Mm -hmm. And FAO is working on that, on how we can create public goods of soil mapping and detail on use on, on inputs so that that can go to the farmers and they can improve the way they use their inputs, given that they are the ones which are the most budget constrained. So big opportunity, big changes happening, but we need to be very careful that we don't exacerbate inequalities. On the contrary, that we supply the public goods that are needed so that these technologies are also reachable to the, to the most vulnerable. E allora grazie ancora Massimo Torero, il Chief Economist della FAO, per averci aiutato a guardare alle sfide del 2023 del cibo e della sicurezza alimentare. Se ne parla sicuramente troppo poco, torneremo a farlo anche insieme alla FAO. Grazie ancora. Thank you so much, Massimo Torero. It was a pleasure. A pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. E grazie per aver seguito anche questo nostro Outlook. Torneremo a parlare di sicurezza alimentare. Avete capito quanto sarà rilevante anche nel corso di quest'anno. Adesso vi lascio agli altri aggiornamenti dalla redazione di Classe NBC.